pitch dark and I'm back again. Look, um, I'm back because it just hit the airwaves that there's a verdict in in the case of A.J. Armstrong, which is Antonio Armstrong Jr. For those who aren't aware of what's going on with that, it's actually taking place in Houston. Uh, it's been going on, I think, since 2016. I mean, um, it's been a real big thing nationally. Uh, Antonio was accused of killing his mother and his father while they were sleeping in their home in Bel Air in Houston, which is somewhat of an upscale area in Houston. And there have been two trials to the, uh, preceding this third trial, and there were hung juries. Um, they couldn't get 12 people to agree to either say he's not guilty or to to uh, adjudicate him as being guilty. Um, that's because in this, this case is entirely circumstantial uh, and highly speculative. What I want to do is I want to get off into this. Before I do, I need to remind everybody, if you believe in the work that we do at the Odyssey Project on so many different levels, show your love, show your support. Look in the description box and give. If you like the content that you're getting, if you find it informative, if you find it encouraging, if you find it inspiring, uh, in those rare times you find it entertaining, <laughs> hit the like button. Uh, definitely share it, and if you want to... Uh, be informed of the times we share content on this channel subscribe okay with that being said look I have seen all the responses to this since it started that run the gamut from he's being framed to how horrible of a person he is to kill his parents and all of it is normally being done without a serious anonymization and critique of the evidence that's available to the public um, a lot of the things you won't hear unless you're actually at the trial or you find a way to get a hold to the tri transcripts from the pre previous trial I have been following this case for a while I have remained extremely tight-lipped about it because I did not want anything that I said to get out there and to sway anybody that may end up on that jury pool uh, I wanted the truth to come out uh, and what I can tell you is there's not a lot there. A lot of it is speculation just based on proximity and opportunity. Uh, obviously, there's some things going on that provide motive and provide some other things, and you have to look at all these things. Here's what I want to warn against, and then I'm going to tell you about something because the, the, there's a verdict in. Uh, I, here, here's what I want to warn against. As a person who advocates for offenders, person that advocates for juvenile offenders uh, as well, I want to tell you that just because he's charged doesn't mean he's guilty. Hell, just because he was found guilty doesn't mean he's guilty. What you've got to understand is we release black men on a regular basis who have put in 25, 35, 45 years for something that DNA eventually proves they didn't do because the system rushes to judgment, cops plant evidence, and let's stop acting like it doesn't happen. I have come across numerous situations where cops have literally been caught at planting evidence. And so the easy jump is they said he did it, so he did it. We've got to stop that. And this isn't me caping for a kid that killed his parents. I don't know either way. What, what I can say is there's definitely enough for question. It tells me it's enough for question when you put a black kid in front of a, a jury and twice and they don't convict him. It tells me there are some unanswered questions. Now, here's the thing. He finally was convicted and sentenced to life with the possibility of parole in 40 years, meaning he's gonna be in his 60s at best when he gets out, if nothing changes, but here's the catch. As soon as the jury was sequestered and went in to deliberate, his attorney filed a lawsuit against the city of Houston. Here's why. Literally days before the third trial is supposed to start, all of a sudden there's some new evidence, blood evidence that shows up. Supposedly his visitor's badge 
uh, at HPD when he was being questioned the night of the murder um, had a smidgen of blood on it that ultimately was tested and was proven to be his dad's blood and they had to, they say that meant it had to come from his shirt well yeah a bunch of different things here uh from what i gather there was no gunshot residue so the, the same kid who if he did it was smart enough to wash the gunshot residue off was dumb enough to leave the shirt on first thing Second of all, you went through two trials and this evidence evidence wasn't there and you couldn't get a conviction. All of a sudden, two days before the trial starts, this evidence is all of a sudden there. And Houston has some uh, a reputation. As times, Houston officers have planted evidence. And you, and you look around. It's happened in New York. It's happened in some other places. It's definitely happened uh, in Alabama. Well, that was an entire uh, unit that for 20 years were planting evidence and framing kids for drugs and murders. And they got caught, and I think all of them ended up going to prison, including the DA. DA was in on it, too. So the idea that law enforcement is so upstanding that we can't trust them, these are the same people we upset about coming into our community killing our kids. You don't think that they have a problem with framing one, especially when there's a chance this kid could ultimately be acquitted and then sue them ultimately be acquitted and throw egg in their face because they have gone out of their way to say he's guilty. Lady Gaga, Jazz and Piano, the Las Vegas residency, and don't be lying to Of course, it just comes on on its own. But this is from the research I was doing before I got on. I do apologize. But hey, so when I say be very, very uh, careful and measured in how you're judging this kid before this all plays out because it hasn't completely played out now here's the thing what i can tell you in the research that i've been able to do and some people i can call uh that are familiar with the civil side of this which is the lawsuit that the attorney filed and he waited till the jury went in and immediately filed he didn't file it before the jury went in because he didn't want to affect the trial and end up having to go through another trial because of um a mistrial because if the jury's got wind of that lawsuit that could cause a misunderstanding the judge would have to rule then we do it all over again we own trial number four and so he waited um and he could also got uh got dinged for uh misconduct if he would have did that as well so he waits and immediately when the jury goes back he files he, he already had it typed up he filed it so that the jury couldn't hear about it. And then so he had a press conference on it. And this is all before the press conference is all before they know whether or not AJ is going to be guilt, found guilty or not. Well, they've just released the statement that he's found guilty. Uh, and everybody's like, man, he's just sitting up there. He's stone faced. He took it like a champ. Uh, you know, he didn't even flinch. Uh, and that's because he's already with, with his his attorneys planning his next move. His life didn't just end for him. He's still fighting, uh, which he should be if he's innocent. Um, and the, here's the crazy thing about it. Um, we oftentimes need what we call closure. I don't believe in closure. Uh, knowing the answer doesn't change the outcome. Uh, sending somebody to prison that's wrong doesn't change the outcome. That's justice. And justice has to be applied, but closure isn't that. But we often want to know the answer. We want to know for certain. This is one of those times I don't think you're ever going to know for certain unless somebody actually comes out and actually says, you know what, I did it. I admit it. It was me. Other than that, there are far too many holes. Now, even if the courts uh, reject this lawsuit or if a jury rejects this lawsuit or a judge rejects this lawsuit about the evidence and the evidence is upheld um, if the law if the lawsuit goes through in the in in, in there's a uh, a civil case one on this lawsuit then the appellate court is going to have to really give some serious attention to uh, whether this evidence 
uh, had an impact and obviously did because you don't get two convictions all of a sudden you get new evidence and you get a conviction you can't say you've literally got two trials prior to that as litmus test to say how flimsy the circumstantial evidence was and how difficult it had been to get a conviction now on the flip side you couldn't get an acquittal here's why you can't get acquittal there's a possibility that he could have done it and so they're gonna that they're gonna be people that are gonna sit up and say he must have did it but there was enough, enough people to sit up and say something's not right to sit up and, and it don't you don't need but one either way but somebody said something's not right here and I'm not going to send an innocent kid to prison. I am always going to lead on the side of I'd rather set, set a guilty man free than send an innocent person to prison. And that's the way it should always be. Here's a problem I have with the system altogether when you look at it and when you study these cases. And I have to because I advocate for these uh, people who often fear going to trial and will literally sign for time for stuff they didn't do to get a lesser sentence than what they're being frightened into believing they could get if they go to trial and lose. They don't trust the system. Here's why they don't trust the system is the DA isn't limited to structuring their case around the evidence. The, the DA is given so much leeway into theory. They can literally come up, this is what I believe happened. I don't give a damn what you believe happened. Show me what happened or shut the fuck up. But that's not what happens. What happens is you can sit up and say, okay, this is, so I believe this happened and I believe this happened. And, 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 and outside of a very strong and sustainable and verifiable alibi that takes the suspect away from the uh, crime scene in a way that they could not have possibly been there at the time of the murder, it's real hard to totally clear them. This kid was in the house, sleep. Now, some people say that the older brother was off to college or was away and was far enough away that it couldn't have been him. Uh, some people are speculating that it could have been or he could have had somebody else go by and do it. Uh, but what I, the, the problem I have with this is the kid makes sure that there's no gun gunpowder residue, gunshot residue on, 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 on him, on his hands. But he didn't take the shirt off that, that he did it in. Um. Yeah, that's that's suspect. So he, you know, he he he's there. He's got time before they get there to clean himself up, but he doesn't take the shirt off. I mean, this is 2016. Everybody's seen enough CSI to know you don't want anything on that you had on when you did it. You want to completely shower, wash down, get the residue off for you, um, and. You want to get rid of all of that bull crap, but he had his on, and it just so happened to be it. Now here's the other part that that makes it even more believable that the, that it may be. Even the police officers that engaged it, every last one of them on the stand said they didn't see any blood on his on his shirt. But all of a sudden the blood is on the badge. Now here here here's some other things that you've got to think about. And see, this is why I guess I'll, you know, I'll never be on the jury. Here's some things you have to think about because you can't just run bull with me. And I don't go off of, uh, ooh, my, ooh, ooh, that must, uh, you, you know, I, I think I go four or five levels deep on anything. How many times have you bled on, 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 on your pants, on your shirt or something like that? How long does the blood stay wet? Especially if the blood is in such a small amount that it can't be seen with the physical eye. How long does it stay wet enough to transfer to where it's visible on another object? Now, again, I can't say with certain certainty that it was planted. But what I'm saying is... You, Lady Gaga, uh, Indiana, the Las Vegas resident. See, let, me get, let me close this. Um, just, just opens. But anyway, so again, my thing is, those are questions you have to ask. And those are things that should have been asked even before the question of it being planet came up. Well, okay. What, you know, but here's the problem. The third jury doesn't know that the first and second jury never saw that.
or maybe they do. I'm not sure. But what I'm saying is it will seem like to me if I feel like, okay, this just came up. When did it just come up? What, two days before the trial? So you're telling me that the same people I'm supposed to trust that was good enough to find this evidence are the same ones that was incompetent, incompetent enough to miss it the first two times? Do you mean that we spent millions of dollars of the city's money because they were too incompetent to see this, which is that obvious? That's a part of evidence. There's so much that's going on with this. And again, I don't think these this is one of those cases where if you're going to be completely honest. With yourself. Uh, you're going to be able to come to a real true conclusion. Uh, people and jurors do it far too much for me. I watch things and I'm going like, how did they come to that conclusion? I mean, it's supposed to be beyond a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt means if I can think there's a possibility somebody else did it, that's a reasonable doubt. I mean, I have to... It's not beyond a shadow of a doubt. It's beyond a reasonable doubt. But a reasonable doubt means that if I can reasonably uh, assume someone else did it, reasonably believe that it's possible that something else could have been outside of what you're telling me, then I can't find this person guilty. It's not, is he more, most likely the one who did it? It's beyond a reasonable doubt. But we get a whole lot of guilties based on, I believe he did it. I'm in prison because you believe I did it or that they proved I did it. That's the burden for the for the prosecution is proof. The, the defense doesn't have the burden of proof. The uh, defense is simply there to point and point poke holes in the proof that the uh, prosecution is supposedly put up. The, the defense's job is not to prove who did it, but to simply present reasonable doubt. It's the. Uh, prosecutor's responsibility to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, beyond, not at a reasonable doubt, beyond a reasonable doubt that this person did it. Now, you, it, at certain points, you can have circumstances when X, Y, Z, and on down the line, it's just so many things that is no way in hell that many coincidences happened all at the same time. You can probably say there's a good chance this person did it. But again, you can't say what well, certainly they did. There's no video. There's no, I mean, you know, you've got to go with the circumstance. But when you've got residue, and see, this is what the DA knows. This is what the police department knows. You can have five police officers say, I didn't see any blood on them. But if there's something with blood evidence, everybody's watched CSI and everybody believes that's how you solve cases. The DNA. So DNA is loud as hell in the courtroom. It'll knock all reason and rationale right out of your mind. How did that get there? It ha he had to do it. He had to do it. How did it get there? You can't tell me. No, he did. And then there it is. And then there's intimidation. There's all kinds of stuff going on in these jury pools. That's the person sitting there going, you know what? I don't believe this crap, but I'm ready to go home. So, whatever. And, unfortunately, lives are changed forever. I've seen, like I said, I've seen far too many brothers. And it's been Latinos and even some white people. But brothers get it, man. They just get it. It's like, bam. If I got it wrong, I got it wrong. That's how they think. And when you interview them, when you interview the, the DA, when the case comes back up and they say, you know, well, I, I don't believe it. I, you know, but they say just showing the DA, the, the, the DNA says it. Now, the, if the DNA is good enough for you to use to convict with, it, it's got to be good enough to be a, a, an exoneration uh, mechanism. The, per, the DNA says it wasn't this guy. It was another guy. Matter of fact, we got the guy. So what now? And the guy is now admit, not that he's caught, he's admitted it. But this guy's done 40 years. That's a real crazy case. I want to say it happened in Louisiana. Guy accused of rape and murder. Spent 40 years in prison. DNA finally came to a stage where they could test it at a level that needed to be tested. And the person who did it was in CODIS. 
which is this national system where uh, offenders' DNA is stored. And they find the guy. They get him. They get on him, and he admits that he did it. This guy's given you 40 years. He's ultimately released. After he's released, two months later, he finds out he finds out he's got terminal cancer. The guy who actually prosecuted him, his I will say this, this guy's heart was broke. He picked up his little feelings. He went to this guy's house. He didn't do no little press conference and say a little something and say, we apologize, whatever, and the city's going to do this and whatever. He went to him and he begged him for forgiveness. God told him, no, I'm not going to forgive you. He told him, I understand, but I still extend my deepest and, and heartfelt apologies. I went with what I had and I believed I was doing the right thing, but I was so wrong. I am so sorry. May God forgive me. And he left. Within a year, this man was dead. Within a year, this man was dead. He gave up his life for something he didn't do, and then he didn't even get to enjoy the freedom on the back end. This happens a lot because it takes its toll on you. Imagine being locked up for that long and that stress building up. That, that, that'll cause cancer. I just talked to you about epigenetics, right? The environmental stress that comes along with being in a prison environment for something you didn't do, and it's eating at you. That's attacking your internal um genetic uh, makeup you, your genes are going through massive uh, uh, in, 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 interferences where you're down regulating healthy genes up regulating disease, disease genes uh, and the environment is constant and you look up and bam at any given time here it is and unfortunately this guy got a year of freedom but a vast majority of that was ill trying to fight and live and ultimately the last three or four months hospice. So don't, so don't be so easy to throw this kid away. Now, if he did it, he's getting what he deserves and, and, it, and it is what it is. But if there's any chance that this kid didn't do it, we need to see it. We need to know it. People need to be held accountable, but they need to stop these magical occurrences of evidence that did not exist. I think that there's got to be a limit on when some physical evidence can just pop up. That's always been there, too. That tag that they found it on has always been there. Now, all of a sudden, it's got blood on it that they see. Uh, and then, as a person from Houston, man, and I've got family that's cops i got boys that i smoke uh cigars with on a regular basis that are cops that i would trust with my life but there's some dirty ass cops in houston i've been around them all my life too i've seen cops pull up on the block grab kids throw them in the car bring them back beat up banged up push them out the car and keep going i've seen cops plant drugs on people who don't even deal drugs give them cases fuck their whole life up so if I'm just a little bit skeptical forgive me now I believe uh, if you saw the video from yesterday you see that I work with Harris County and will continue to work with Harris County as long as they provide an avenue for me to reach families of incarcerated men to service them and to help them and to do something we need a much bigger platform though because obviously there's going to be limited movement and limited things you can say and all that. But I'd rather have some access to them than none. I would much rather be able to do it on our own where we can actually act solely on our best interests without the politics. Now, this black major that I'm working with, I really believe he's legitimate. Have He's not shown me in almost a year that he's not. Um, but again limited resources limited activity and we need so much more we need day-to-day -day engagement to protect our kids but again we've got to be on board we got to be uh in a mindset of unity and the truth of the matter is uh, we've been programmed to not be 
unified to not support cause. We're literally programmed. We'll, we're programmed to seek entertainment. We'll spend a lot of money on entertainment. We'll spend a lot of money on making sure we look good. We'll spend a lot of money so that we can brag, but we will not spend money to build. We will not invest time, energy, and effort in building. We will not come together and support and collaborate so that we can unify. And Dr. Anderson, Dr. Amos Wilson, Dr. Naeem Agbar, Dr. Francis Chris Welsing, Dr. Uh, John Henry Clark, Dr. Yo Yosef Benyakla, Dr. Asa Hilliard, Dr. Khaled Muhammad, and I can go on down and on. All stood up and told us that basically what, what Dr. Anderson said, but in one form or one shape or one term or whatever, they've all said that if we don't function as a unit, if we don't function as a team, we're going to lose. We're going to lose by default, and here we are, losing. And acting surprised that we're losing. Acting surprised that the system isn't operating the way we think it should. Actually, the system is operating exactly how it's supposed to operate. It's that we aren't opposing the system with a great enough force to see our interests served. This system isn't designed for us people. It's designed to exploit, mishandle, misuse for the benefit of others, not us. And it's our responsibility to do something different about it. So on that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. I just had to drop back in. I wasn't planning on doing another one today, uh, at least not uh, in the office. I was probably going to do another riding with Rick, but this one was too much for a ride with Rick. I really wanted to give it some time. Um, again, if if he's actually guilty, you know, uh, may God have mercy on his soul, um, and hopefully he'll get some things done and change his life inside or whatever went on. It's some things that were going on in that house too that I'm not going to get into until I'm more informed, but I've been asking around and I've been looking to, like I said, since 2016, this has been going on a while. And there's definitely some things that were going on in that house. Um, but again, the entire family, grandparents and everybody, the, the, the people who died's parents are supporting this kid. So there's something there. What? I don't know. But it's something there, and, and, and it's just, just some fishy stuff going on from the law enforcement side that doesn't allow me to give the validity and weight to this guilty verdict that I would probably normally give. And then I'm always skeptical when we're involved. Hell, I'm skeptical of some of the stuff I've seen with white people on trial. The idea is to win, not to find the truth. And whenever you get to that point, you start to do whatever you need to do to win. You have to really be careful about it. That's why we don't want our children caught up in this system. So on that note, I'm getting ready to get out of here. Remember what I said. If you like what you are getting on this channel, hit the like button, hit the share button, and subscribe. If you believe in the work that we're doing as an organization and what I'm doing as an individual, look in the description box and donate. That's my challenge. I'm calling you out to do it. We've got to do something different. We can't continually sit around and expect someone else to fix our problems. On that note, look, I'm out of here. You guys have an unbelievable remainder of your day. Yeah. Yeah. They said I should give it up like yeah. that just ain't good enough. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time you know outside of the businesses that i run like myriad business solutions the visionetics institute odyssey media group i also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in houston dallas and other areas uh, i'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the odyssey project is doing in the inner cities uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.
Thank you.